Before this video starts, I'd like to let you know about an event coming up in a couple of days' time on August the 10th. For those who are going to be in or near Lviv, Ukraine, I highly recommend you to come and see Silicon Curtain live in Lviv when I'll be in Ukraine for the first time, joined by many of the guests who you may have seen on the channel. On August the 10th, we'll be moderating and filming a panel event in Lviv. The aim is to show our solidarity with Ukraine and generate awareness of its struggle for survival and liberty against Russian aggression. For those of you who are not in Ukraine, I don't advise you to travel, especially because, of course, it is a war zone. There is some level of danger. But if you are in or near Lviv and you are able to come along, then please do. Our venue is a secure conference center underground. The precise location will be announced just before the event kicks off and a message will be sent to those who have registered. Now, places are limited. We have a maximum of 250 seats. We expect it to fill out. So please do register your interest as soon as you can using the website link, which you can find in the description of this video. The event will feature some of the most accomplished journalists and experts, as well as some of your favorite guests from this channel. That includes Alina Palyakova, Julia Timoshenko, and the inimitable John Sweeney. There will be four panel events, one on Ukraine's vibrant volunteer society, the second panel on the challenges of reporting the war, especially in the environment of intense propaganda. The third panel is on culture versus tyranny, which plays a huge part in Ukraine's resilience and success in fighting back against Russia. And finally, there'll be a panel on victory and freedom, where Anna from Ukraine, who many of you will be familiar with, is joining us, as well as Alexei Gancharenko and other guests, Alina Khalushka, and hopefully a few more. And then finally, the event wraps up with a Q&A session where the audience will be allowed to pose questions to the guests. There will be networking sessions in between the main panels. It's an all-day event, so if you are there, you will get the chance to meet the speakers and to put your own individual questions to them during the breaks. And we're holding this event not only to try and contribute to the future of Ukraine as an independent country and help it towards its victory, but the very survival of democracy across Europe, we believe, is under threat. The contagion of Russian authoritarian control and toxic information warfare is aggressively pushing out across the world. And if Putin is allowed to win Ukraine, will do so with renewed vigor. This is not just Ukraine's fight, but involves anyone who values liberty, democracy, diversity, and the rule of law. So if you're in or near Lviv on August the 10th, please do help out and join us for this unique event. For those who are outside of Ukraine and who are not able to join, we will be live streaming the Q&A and all the panel sessions will be recorded, edited professionally, and put on the Silicon Curtain channel in the days following the event. So please do check those out. Watching them will also help us greatly to expand the audience of the channel and get our message across. Slava Ukraine. Alexei Goncherenko was born in Odessa and is a Ukrainian politician, member of parliament, and uh, part of the Ukrainian delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, Vice President of PACE Committee on Migration, Refugees and Internally Placed Persons, and is a founder of the Ukrainian Network of Educational and Cultural Centres, Gancherenko Centres. Alexei, welcome back to the channel. Thank you. Hello. Well, we're going to start talking about what's been happening recently because the fight has very decisively moved to the black sea region clearly russia is extremely upset but also has strategic plans to disrupt the grain deal uh and is attacking edessa so what is going on uh, like you said uh, really now the hot place of this war is uh, south in ukraine more south in ukraine both in terms of ukrainian counteroffensive in direction of the Azov seashore and what's going on in the Black Sea. Uh, the Black Sea, by the way, is a strategical place for, for, for centuries and thousands of years, for millennia. Uh, but maybe many people forgot about it. 
that the region of the Black Sea is a breadbasket of the civilized world from the times of ancient Greeks. Uh, and uh, today, again, we see how important is the Black Sea and what a struggle is uh, here for initiative uh, in the Black Sea and for control of uh, the northern part of the Black Sea. Uh, part of Russian plans uh, to cause as much chaos in the world as possible is the disruption of Ukrainian agricultural export, uh, which is crucial for world food security. Uh, we need to remember that many, some countries like, for example, Egypt, Lebanon, uh, Libya and other countries are dependent from Ukrainian grain up to 90 percent. And uh, that is very, very significant. And in general, according to estimations of the United Nations, 400 million people throughout the whole world are dependent from the calories from Ukrainian crops. And uh, Putin tries by attacking Ukrainian agricultural export to achieve several goals at once. Uh, first is to hurt Ukraine economically, because definitely today that's the most important uh, part of Ukrainian export. Uh, secondly, to uh, earn uh, direct money from the picking of food prices, because Russia is a big exporter, one of the biggest exporters uh, of food in the world. Thirdly, it's an uh, attempt to cause by uh, hunger and starvation in developing countries, first of all, to cause by this political destabilization, new waves of refugees and migrants to Europe in order to distract the free world from support of Ukraine and from struggle with Russia. So he has many goals and that's why he is so actively attacking Odessa supports and Ismail ports, ports of Odessa region, because this is a strategic point. And uh, why he is attacking the ports? Because in reality, he can't attack the ships. That's the point. Because attacking the, for example, ship on the Turkish flag or UK flag, it, or US flag, it means direct attack against these, according to international law, that means the war against these countries. And Putin is definitely not ready to start any new war now. Uh, that's why he was very, when he uh, left the grain deal, he was very concerned about could the deal uh, exist without him, without Russia. And that's why he attacked the ports in order to raise the risks for insurance companies, for ship owners, for crews, in order to prevent uh, the ships, uh, the vessels, to come to uh, ports of Odessa region. And there's another aspect, isn't it, which I think really reveals the mafia terrorist strategy, and that is that Russia pretends to be friendly with countries of the Middle East and Africa. We saw uh, a conference in, in Russia last week where supposedly, you know, Russia is, is a great and colonial leader, etc. I mean, we know this is all absolute nonsense. Um, behind the scenes, however, these countries must understand that, that Russia has its hands around their throat. Russia is threatening their food supplies. Russia is pretend, you know, um, attempting to destroy the ability of Ukraine to supply those countries so that Russia has control and political leverage over them. Do you do you see that as part of the strategy? Uh, definitely, you're exactly right. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, uh, this uh, Russia-Africa summit was, was not uh, at all successful. And we see that how President, for example, of South and African Republic which is uh, quite, I can say, at least very neutral to Russia, maybe even friendly. But uh, he said openly and in the eyes of Putin, we need grain deal. We don't need your like some, you know, 20, 30,000 tons of grain uh, as a gift. You can leave this gift, but don't disrupt the world food security. And that was a clear message. Uh, in general, I think that uh, uh, exactly like a year ago, Putin didn't want this deal from the very beginning, but uh, pressure from uh, Turkey and from global South countries, mm, they uh, made him to agree. 
And uh, I think we have chances that these will uh, repeat. And uh, in, in August, probably Putin will visit Turkey. And uh, I hope that Erdogan will pressure him. Uh, and I'm sure that African leaders pressured him. Uh, and also, I just want to raise your attention that what, why it is important what's happened in the last days in the Black Sea with Ukrainian attacks, uh, with the drone attacks, it's right to say like this, because Ukrainian Ministry of Defense never uh, took responsibility for this. But uh, what other drones could be in the Black Sea, which are attacking Russian fleet? And uh, first it was a Russian military ship, Aliningorsky Garniak, uh, which is the big uh, uh, landing ship, uh, ship for landing of Marines, uh, but also with, uh, with the guns and everything. And then it was a tanker. Uh, and uh, I think that's very important because Russia is very dependent from its Azov and Black Sea ports. And uh, Ukraine, uh, by Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, uh, announced that the Equatoria and the territories around Russian ports are a dangerous zone. Exactly the same like Russia did about Ukrainian ports. And we showed by this that this is the game which can be played by two. And uh, for Russia, it is a big problem because that will mean that the fraught prices will raise for Russian goods, everything, for Russian oil, for Russian uh, grain. Uh, and Black Sea is vital for Russian economy. So I think that it's the right answer to Russian blackmailing is just to show that this is, there is this kind of coming back to Russia itself, what they are doing. And if they are blocking Ukrainian part of Black Sea, Ukraine can block Russian part of Black Sea in this or other way. And that will be very, very painful for Russia, too. That's right. Force uh, seems to be the only thing that uh, actually is comprehended uh, in the Kremlin. Um, now, on a personal note, I saw your very moving video uh, the day after the attack on the cathedral in uh, in uh, Odessa. Now, that is an extraordinary building uh, that was originally destroyed by the Soviets um, and rebuilt with obviously extreme amount of care, um, incredibly beautiful structure. Now, not everything that Russia does is strategic. Some of it uh, is out of spite, envy, and just sheer uh, willful destruction. Could you share your personal feelings and, and, and what is the effect on Odessans of this attack on this really important symbol of their city. Yeah, um, that's painful because like being, I was born in Odessa, that's my native city. Uh, and, uh, and it's very painful to see how such beautiful city is being destroyed. And it's not only cathedral, uh, like it's near 50 buildings, 25 of, the, of which are architectural monuments were damaged or destroyed during ra last Russian attacks. And it's so barbaric. And I want to remind you that historical center of Odessa is enlisted in World Heritage List of UNESCO. So it is the, it is the heritage of the whole humankind. And it's one of the most beautiful cities of uh, Europe and, and like acting so barbaric. So, in general, attacks against Odessa, that's something we should understand. As I already told you, it's not just attack against one million of Odessa people. It's not just attack against 40 millions of Ukrainians. It's attack against hundreds of millions of people throughout the world who are connected in this or other way with Odessa, by their ancestors, by visiting, by tourism, and so on, and to 400 million people who are dependent from calories which are transported by Odessa ports. So this is attack against the whole humankind. That's why it's painful. Speaking about cathedral, uh, yes, uh, I was shocked to see. I, by the way, uh, I'm not sure that Russia attacked the cathedral consciously and deliberately. I don't know. Because even for Russia, it's so crazy. Because I can't understand wh what for. 
it could be done. Interesting theme that cathedral uh, was operated by Ukrainian church, which is part of Russian church. And in reality, and and the hierarchs, metropolit uh, of Odessa of this church, for example, was probably one of the most pro-Russian priests in Ukraine. And uh, after this attack, he came out with a with a public statement that Russia isn't even Orthodox country, Christian country. So he doubted the fact that Russians are Christians. So it's something unbelievable because again, it was one of the most pro-Russian uh, priests in, in the country. And uh, so I, I don't know how it happened, but in any way, I think Russia just doesn't care what will be destroyed Maybe they tried to attack port, but cathedral is quite far away from port. I don't know uh, how it happened. Definitely it is painful. But again, we can rebuild everything. Uh, and uh, thanks to God, during these attacks, there were not many killed, just two people. Uh, just it sounds like, yet yeah, it's a tragedy. But with this level of attacks, it could be dozens and dozens of people if not hundreds. So just two people and uh, everything else we will uh, rebuild. This seems to me an absolutely crucial time where the Ukrainian offensive is making progress. But there does seem to be, in my view, some extremely unreasonable whining from Western diplomats and comments from um, so-called military experts that talk about the slow progress of the counteroffensive. Um, it seems that this is a crucial time where any slowing or delays in Western support um, could have a terrible impact on loss of life within Ukraine itself. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we're running an event next week in Lviv. Really, uh, not just fo focusing on esoteric subjects, we're focusing on Ukrainian victory, how that can be achieved and how the cost of that victory can be reduced. Um, we're very much encouraging sort of people to come along on the day, but what do you think is the importance at this time of trying to raise Ukraine's uh, you know, awareness of Ukraine, not just in the minds of the public, but in the minds of decision makers uh, around the Western Alliance? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for doing this event. I think that is a very, very time and I think that it is very, very important. And today, uh, like there are two things uh, on, on which we rely on. And in reality, you know, the whole free world relies on is Ukrainian courage and Western weaponry. That's two things. And uh, without one of these things, it, it will just not work. We need to understand it, realize it. Uh, speaking about counteroffensive, um, I'm not a military expert, but I think the first thing we should acknowledge that the war is unpredictable and nobody really can tell you what will happen tomorrow and how it will continue. It's very hard to, to, to make any uh, such prophecies. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that unfortunately, uh, during all these hesitations, the free world lost too much time with the supply of weaponry to Ukraine. And Russia used this time to uh, dig in, to mine the fields, to entrench, to, to, to use these possibilities to build really strong defense. And they succeeded in this. Uh, today, to... to break through these uh, defense lines, we need uh, really more weaponry. I just like speaking about the results of counteroffensive, just taking military theory. Do we have advantage in number of troops? Not. Do we have advantage in the skies? Not. Russia has advantage in the skies. Do we have advantage in number of artillery? No. Do we have advantage in number of munition? No. The only advantages we have is advantage in moral of Ukrainian troops and advantage in the quality of the weaponry. So if we really want to see the results, 
I think finally all these absolutely vague and strange red lines about weaponry supply to Ukraine should be taken away. Ukraine should receive F-16s. Ukraine should receive long-range missiles attackers for high marches. By the way, probably that's the most important because F-16s, it will take months before pilots and infrastructure will be ready. Uh, but attackers we can use right now because we have high marches, we have trained crew. We need more armor and we need more munition. That is uh, the recipe. Uh, and if everything, if that is probably that's the last moment this year when we can still change something. If uh, the decisions will not be made till the middle of August, I think that uh, this year uh, it will be already too late. To, to receive a decisive result which can finish this war and restore international order and international law. And this is why I think we're seeing the uptick, isn't it, in the in the Black Sea as potentially the first stage in a major siege to try and uh, you know starve uh, Russian forces of the logistical supplies they need to make uh, further gains. Um, in that respect, uh, I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't reveal any secrets, but I think um, it's quite likely that we'll see uh, further devastating uh, impact on the Kerch Bridge, or at least we can only hope that that happens soon. We hope so. Let me keep fingers crossed. The bridge, this bridge is very, very tight, so I think it should rest. Absolutely. Now, another another aspect, of course, uh, which hasn't been quite successful for Russia in all the alliance countries uh, is their informational warfare. But I'm really detecting an uptick uh, in, uh, I would say, activation of, uh, you know, the useful idiots, the assets abroad and so on. In the US, uh, Trump is perhaps less uh, a threat than he was. I do myself class him as a as a Russian asset or at least a, an extremely useful idiot. Um, we have Kennedy, who is another kind of sock puppet uh, candidate spewing Russian propaganda. But also in Germany, you have anti-NATO protests and so on. As Russia gets more desperate and loses on the battlefield, do you see them placing a greater emphasis again on this informational warfare? Absolutely. They will continue to do this. You mentioned Germany. Just watch a recent uh, Spiegel and Billion Cat uh, investigation that a direct Russian agent, uh, Sergei Yenka, infiltrated IFD, Alternative for Germany, and uh, organized a lawsuit against decisions on weaponry supply to Ukraine, uh, even uh, in my in parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe, where I work. Uh, they they prepared special statements from IFD members with some kind of, you know, it's not so obvious who is guilty and all this bullshit. So Russia will do their best. That's the moment for them. That's the crucial moment. They are on the edge of existing. And this empire will use all the tools they still have propaganda, agents, intelligence, uh, FSB, provocations, useful idiots, and or anybody else in order, to, in order to survive and in order to save the empire. So that's, uh, that's absolutely clean. And uh, really the last question here relates to the theme of the event we're running, um, and that is resistance against tyranny reporting the war accurately uh, in an environment of uh, propaganda. But the main panel uh, that we are running uh, on Thursday is to do with victory, how to achieve it, how to reduce the cost of achieving it. And what does it actually mean? Because my view is that victory does not end on the battlefield. It ends when every Ukrainian is returned from Russia, every kidnapped child, uh, and when restitution is made for the crimes. Um, I'd love to hear your view on victory and what it means, but also the risks and the risks arising of the West making accommodations with Russia and seeking peace treaties um, 
that frees the conflict. Um, and we're running a series of interviews with the Chatham House think tank because they have done a very effective paper on why accommodating Russia, appeasing Russia, and seeking peace without victory is an extremely dangerous course. But I'd love to hear your, your view on that too. Definitely. I think uh, there is a quite clear definition of what victory is for Ukraine. And it's not just victory for Ukraine, it's also victory for the world. And by the way, it's victory for Russians too. It's uh, decolonization and de-imperialization of Russia. Russian empire should uh, disappear. Russian empire should go to history and never come back. That's the only, because when we're speaking about, okay, uh, definitely for us, we need to go to our internationally recognized borders, but does it mean the victory? Maybe not, because Russia can still attack after this. Or the war will continue on these borders. Or what will happen? Or Russia will attack us by missiles. Oh, blah, you know, many of what will happen in the Black Sea, and so on and so on and so on. So the key, the problem, the most why this war happened is because Russian Empire is still alive. No matter how it is called, Russian Empire, Soviet Union, Russian Federation. It's the same Russian empire. And before this empire will disappear, there will not be security in Europe. There will not be security in the world. That is something which we clearly understand. There is uh, definitely all parallels uh, always are uh, not, not, not exactly correct. But I think here is very good parallel with Germany. Germany, after German Empire disappeared in 1945, after a process of denazification, de-imperialization, became a wonderful, prosperous state, which is based on the key values of democracy, human rights, rule of law, which is extremely valuable member of international community. But let us just remember what was Germany before this. That was a constant threat to everybody. Yeah, so that is the that is the most important, and that what Ukrainian victory is, and that is what the world's victory is. And I said Russians' victory too, because who more benefited from disappearing of German Empire than Germans themselves? And uh, Russians are hostages of this empire, uh, and uh, yes, they are guilty too. Uh, they're guilty because today they are supporting this empire. They have these in their heads, like Germans had it. But as Germany shows to us, it is treatable. And uh, that's the most important. That's what, what should happen. Well, thank you for that clear statement. I think it's incredibly important to, to have vision for the kind of Russia we want to see. Uh, it's very important as well to have a vision for what would happen in the in the terrible circumstance that Russia was to win. Now, I think that's unlikely, but um, the results of that would be too cataclysmic to mention. And that's one of the topics we're exploring uh, in these Chatham House interviews to try and really focus people's minds on why this fight is taking place. And it's why we're doing the, the event next week. Um, your support for that event is hugely appreciated. And of course, your time on a Sunday morning to speak to our audience here on the channel. Uh, Alexei, it's been a huge pleasure uh, catching up with you again. Thank you very much. And you asked me, what is, the, what is the mood of Odessa people? Let us show with my uh, junior son, Kirill. That's the mood of Odessa people. And that is the message of Odessa people to Russians and to Russian empire. That's what is our message, and we are sure in our victory. Slava Ukraini. Grand Slava.